Yeah. Welcome everyone. Ingo has asked me to introduce our speaker here today, which is a pleasure for me. And the best way to introduce him is let him introduce himself. And this is what he says about himself, physicist, professor of applied mathematics. I'll come back to that. He's coordinator of uh, uh, FED Open uh, Human Behavior in Large Sociotechnical Systems. Uh, he's leading a project uh, supported by the Fundación BBVA to study and model the structure of digital societies. This is the topic of today's uh, talk. He also claims to promote citizen awareness of an, of an engagement uh, with science. And the first one, which I could not read, Professor of Applied Mathematics, but he's a physicist in the Universidad Carlos III of Spain, research on complex systems and applications to physics and uh, mathematics in complex systems. Got his PhD in, uh, in the University in the Universidad Complutense, Madrid. That was on nonlinear phenomena, solid and noise. I remember that. Uh, he was a uh, postdoc at uh, uh, Los Alamos, and uh, well, the rest is at his. Um, something I, I like to, uh, to say is uh, which are the most quoted, I don't know if important, but the most quoted papers by, uh, by Ancho. One is on evolutionary game theory, temporal and spatial effects beyond replicator dynamics. It's uh, published in Physics of Life Reviews, and it is a very good review of different uh, modeling of game theory. Um, I think that's what uh, triggered him to start doing experiments to see how much of these models had anything to see with reality. And one of his uh, most quoted papers is in the uh, 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 Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, precisely on those uh, experiments. He used to claim that it was the largest experiment ever. And uh, he also, back in the past, had uh, uh, papers with, uh, uh, with uh, large influence on, uh, on traffic, uh, on traffic uh, flow models. Uh, beyond that, I would uh, like to say that uh, he's been uh, uh, one of the main driving force in, uh, in building up in Spain the community of uh, statistical and nonlinear physics, and also uh, a main driving force in Spain and Europe in uh, building uh, the community of uh, complex systems, complex systems, and interdisciplinary approaches, uh, especially to social science. Uh, last but not least, he's a good friend of me. Many other people, some of them, uh, uh, not here. And uh, I think if uh, we've been in the same side of the trench, many scientific initiatives, so I'm, uh, I'm very glad to have a to be with us. Thank you, Maxi. I have to say I'm uh, flattered by the introduction, uh, certainly undeserved. Uh, but anyway, uh, today for a change, I'm not going to tell about experiments, or mostly not. Uh, you know, working with economists, I've learned that these guys, I mean, they are clever. Economists are clever. So for every, like, like season, they have a talk. And they go around the world giving the same talk everywhere. So now I'm planning to do the same thing. The unfortunate thing is that you're going to be my guinea pigs with this talk because I never gave it before. So it's the first time I, I present these results. And therefore, I hope that I don't do it uh, too badly. Just, I apologize from the start about that, but let's see if you can help me improve it. Everything that goes uh, wrong with the talk, it's my fault. What's good in the talk, it's particularly due to this guy here, who's my student, Ignacio. He's a very good, uh, very good student, and most of what's in the talk, it's his idea. I may have kick-started the problem, but he has developed most of what I'm going to say. And then, uh, uh, my uh, lifelong collaborator, Jose Cuesta, has also contributed a lot, and uh, Robin Dunbar is also part of this uh, endeavor, mostly because it deals with the stuff he proposed many years ago. And that's exactly where I'm going to start my talk today. So Robin's idea comes back, I don't know, this paper was published after a long fight in 1992, and uh, Robin's idea is the social brain hypothesis, namely, we as humans have a big brain because we need it for social purposes. And big brains 
a big uh, role of social relations have co-evolved together. That, in a nutshell, is the uh, basic idea of the social brain hypothesis. So Robin was uh, searching for uh, hard evidence in favor of this. The first point to support this idea is the realization that relationships are complicated, and we all know that. I don't have to convince you about that, right? It's really complicated, particularly relations that are uh, with people who are emotionally close to us. And that's because it needs time, but as I will say later, it needs also resources, cognitive resources. So in this cartoon, for instance, one of the cognitive resources is the level of depth in which you can go into recursive thoughts. And as we all know, with your partners at home, often you need to go over very many levels. And that's complicated as well. So the evidence uh, of, of, our, uh, of the limited capacity of uh, our brain to process relationships, Robin likes to support it on this plot. This is a regression of something that has to do with the size of our neocortex, where uh, the processing of social relationships takes place. And this is the mean group size of different species. Prosimians, monkeys, apes, I think this is uh, chimps, I think this, this is gorillas, uh, this is probably orangutans, and this is us. So if we believe that this regression has any value, then we have our data and we can say that the typical group size of uh, humans is about 150. And this number has become quite famous. And it's called today Dunbar's number. And it tells us that the group that we can handle in terms of social relationships is about that size. Now I will present evidence supporting this in a second, but this is uh, typically so, for instance, in, in the army, the basic unit is the company, which is about that. It's well known that many uh, companies, uh, I mean business companies, split up when they get to numbers like that. So maybe it's not 150, maybe it's 100, maybe it's 200, but that's the order of magnitude of what we can do. And of course, this is an average. Some people can keep zillions of relationships, apparently. And some people forget everything about everybody. So uh, exactly if that is the number, now we have to take into account another thing, that it's the cost of relationships is heterogeneous. Not every relation requires the same resources. And let me speak about resources. Resources, as I said, maybe time, maybe memory. You don't like to forget uh, your anniversary with your partner. That typically has bad consequences. But uh, if I forget Max's birthday, I don't really care. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there's different levels of relation that require different amount of resources. And I think that's also pretty obvious uh, assertions that we can agree with. Uh, the relation with friends and family is more uh, time demanding in principle. There's uh, also the problem of uh, emotional closeness. Some people are closer to others. So in, in essence, what we have is like a fingerprint of everybody in terms of their relationships. And this, as I said, this comes also from the fact that from the resources available, you need memory, you need intentionality, which is these levels of recursivity. And of course, our prefrontal cortex is different in some people from the other and has different capabilities. But it's reasonable to think that these relationships are heterogeneous. So this led to the next step in Dunbar's idea, which is the existence of a hierarchical organization. So we have Dunbar's number, which is like about 150, but then not all these 150 relationships are equal. What they found in this paper, uh, by looking at different uh, field studies of different groups of, of humans all over the world, is that if you look at the typical sizes of their groups, you find like peaks at certain numbers. So you have groups of uh, like four or five people, then you have look, groups of 15, 20 people, then you have about 50, and then you have about 150. So the groups are not homogeneously distributed, they appear in precise numbers. And that's what has been called Dunbar's circles. Now, this is the original observation by Robin and co-authors of this uh, phenomenon. And uh, therefore, they uh, said that the smallest group is your support group. It's really your 
closest family, your closest friends, really like four or five people. And typically, Robin's claim, I'll come back to that later, is that that should be a click. That everybody should share all this support group. But then you have a sympathy group of about 15 people, really close friends. You see them often, and you go out with them often. You keep track of what happens to them. Then you have acquaintances, like 40, 50. You can tell a lot of things about them, but maybe you don't talk to them more than twice uh, every six months. And then you have people who you really don't care much about, but they're like on your contact list. Okay? So this is the structure of Dunbar circles. This, in fact, is circle. So these five are included in this 15, these 20 are included in this 50, and so on and so forth. This is what's known. And there's a lot to say about this, more so now that there is a digital life in which people have zillions of followers, and one would need to think about higher levels of circles. That's another story. I'm going to stick to this part of the idea. There's evidence for that, yes. Further evidence was obtained uh, in already in this decade from Twitter. The typical uh, group sizes are like this. And the interesting thing is that, again, this factor is like three that factors the size of the different circles is there are two. You can see the scaling is more or less around three. There's evidence, it doesn't say it here, but there's evidence from Facebook too. So there's like, again, these circles with the scalings close to, to three. And these are results of ours in a school. I'll tell more about this if I have time at the end of, uh, of the talk because I find this very inter interesting. We're working with an undisclosed an undisclosable school in Madrid, and we are uh, running surveys with our students, and we uh, can also see that the people who they care most, the average is about six something, and people who should be on the sympathy group should be like 13, 14. So there's pretty much evidence, there's more papers. I'm just selecting a few of these. So we have two stylized facts we want to understand. One is the existence of Dunbar's number, and the other one is the existence of Dunbar circles. What I'm going to tell you today, and from this slide on you can go to sleep, you know what I came here to say, it's two things. We have a model in which we are able to explain both the number and the structure just by cognitive limitations. So what I claim is that the structure and the number, not only the number, the structure arises from our cognitive limitations, Cognitive, again, could include time, could include purely cognitive, whatever, from resource limitations. That's message number one. And message number two is that our model, I like the model, really, is so powerful that predicts something that hasn't been seen. And we have been able to see this once we knew we had to look for it. And that's the second part of this. We now know that there is another type of social uh, structure. Here when I'm speaking about social structure, let me be precise about this. Speak, I speak about what sociologists call ego networks. So the structure of one person's relationships. I'm not speaking of the social structure of everybody's connecting with everybody. Okay? You would have to build that up from the ego networks. So I'm speaking about ego networks. And what I say is that there is another type that hasn't been observed because people didn't know it could exist. It's predicted by our model and we found it. And like I said, this is the message of the talk. So now I'm going to try to convince you of this, that the message is, is that. Okay, so far so good. Model, very simple, very uh, easy. That's me, I'm with the uh, N other persons there, and I have to uh, distribute them in different layers. So I'm assuming there are layers. Okay, that will later give rise to the circles by uh, union. This is not a limitation of the model. We can work a continuum theory. It's uglier. It's more difficult to explain. So I'm not doing that. I'm using layers. But we can dispense of the layers. Okay? Now, if I have layers, both Ignacio and uh, Jose are very Bayesian people, so they like very much Bayesian statistics. So they say, okay, let's do some Bayesian magic here. To, for starters, we have a prior. We don't know anything. I have these N guys. So prior is I'm distributing them randomly among the layers. It's irrelevant. The different layers have different relationship cost. So if you leave 
here you are a relationship that costs me more than if you live down here. Okay? But in principle, I don't know nothing. I just assume that these guys are there at random. And now I add two pieces of information, which are the pillars of the model. Piece number one, there's a limited amount of links we can handle. So the average number of people in all the layers is a constant L. Okay? So the cognitive capability is not infinite. That's it. And the other thing is that the total cost is S. So here it's the same thing, only I'm multiplying by the cost. What is, what is LK? LK is the layer. The number of people in the layer. Uh, yes, the number of people in the layer. So there are no links in the central network? No, no, it's an ego network. It's my relationship with these guys. I don't care whether they are connected with each other or not. When I speak later about the school, I will, but that's a different problem. Okay, so then you go and do some maximum entropy principle calculations, and this is uh, basically what you have to maximize. The calculations are uh, not so complicated, but I, I mean not appropriate for a quarter to three. So in the end, you end up with this posterior. And the posterior gives you uh, this expression here, which basically, as I will say in a second, gives you a distribution of people that is not anymore homogeneous among the layers. So there will be less people, in principle, in the upper layer, in the more costly one, and more people in the other one. Okay? In fact, the model has only one parameter, that is this mu here. This is the only thing that is free, and it's fixed by uh, Jesper. Yeah, every layer has a cost. It's a parameter uh, of the you model. Put, you put a, uh, a priori. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the final say second layer costs one tenth of first layer? No, 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 no. The theory so far is general. It only assumes the ordering of the okay. costs. So you put a cost at yeah. the layer? Yeah. Later I will use linear costs okay. for the easiness of the calculations. But for the time being, it's just order. But I don't need to specify any function whatsoever. So I have only this parameter that, as I will show in a second, is related to the, uh, yes, I will say it at some point. Manolo. I'll finish it. <laughs> <laughs> no, just my question is, you're introducing this cost in your optimization. Normally, when you see I mean, some optimization, you have a trade-off between benefit and cost. You This cost you do uh, more, but gives you more benefit. And yeah. You have the cost, so yeah, uh, what I'm assuming, that's a very good point. That's a very good point. What I'm assuming is that uh, layers that are more costly give you more emotional benefit. So if you live in layer one, you are like my partner or my close friends or whatever, that's more emotionally satisfying to me than if I have you in the lowest layer. So benefit is? is similar to cost. It's basically associated to cost. cost. Okay. Yeah, there's evidence, psychologists, the, the funny thing about doing this kind of stuff is that you get to read papers by all kinds of people. And uh, psychologists have a, a few papers in which they are able to really connect the investment in a relationship with the satisfaction of the people. So, but I should have said that, so thank you for the question. So we have this parameter that is uh, arises, as I will show, from the relation between the cognitive cost and the number of uh, people you can, uh, from your cognitive limit and the number of people you handle. We'll come back to that. But this is the only parameter that it's free. So you can compute the uh, ratio between the number of people uh, in the layers. And then if this mu is positive, you get Dunbar circles. The precise scaling, of course, depends on the mu. And that will have to be determined. But you get a structure in which you have less people in the more emotionally close uh, uh, layer and more people in the remote layers, just like that. But now the interesting thing is that nothing prevents this parameter from being negative. And it can be negative, in fact. And if it's negative, you get something that has never been seen, which we call inverse regime. And in the inverse regime, what we have is a lot of people in the emotionally close layer, and less and less people in the upper layers. Yes? So it's one question, because I might have skipped it. Um, how did you get, because you said prior you uh, distributed Random distribution. Randomly. 
And then what did you optimize or what did you calculate to, to get this? We maximized this, which is going to give you uh, the distribution P that is compatible with the prior and with the restrictions here according to the maximum entropy principle. Okay, okay, maximum. Yeah, but I mean, we can go through the calculations, but, no, 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 no. <laughs> but no, it's no, kind no, of a standard recipe. The calculation is only what it means. Okay, it means that this uh, somehow um, fulfills the constraints. Yeah, exactly. Okay. This, you could see this as Lagrange multipliers, basically. Okay. And that, that would be kind of the same thing. So we were here with the inverse regime. Uh, and you may think, whoa, 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 now if your cognitive cost is limited, how come you can have that many people in the upper layer? I will show you how in a second. Now, if you further assume, and here comes Perez's question, so far I only assumed order, order between the costs, but now I simplify my theory, I particularize it, I assume linear costs for the different layers. If you do that, you can do the calculations more explicitly and then you find a constant scaling. When, this, when the costs are linear, you find something that is also more or less compatible with the evidence. Of course, it's not the only explanation. Maybe other functions will do it. But at least if it's linear, you get a constant scaling. And the other case is when it's linear but negative, you get that the scaling ratio goes to 1. So you have the same number of people in every layer. So everybody, not in every layer, in every circle, I mean in the union of the layers. So everybody is emotionally close to you. And we need to understand how this happens. And uh, these this two plots may be a little bit confusing, so I'll try to uh, walk you through them. So this is the relation of mu to my two parameters, the cognitive total cognitive uh, uh, capability and the number of links I can have. And the mu is related to this by a complicated function. This is the minimum cost. This is the maximum force cost. But what you see is that depending on S over L, you can have positive or negative mu. So when S over L is small, that means I have little cognitive capability, S is small, then I have positive mu. And when I have large S over L, I have larger cognitive capability, I have negative mu. But look, the cognitive capability is not measured absolutely, it's measured as a relation of the number of available links. Okay? So that gives you what is small or what is large. Okay? So when you are in the small cognitive uh, capability regime, you have the typical Dunbar circle picture, you have few people in circle one, more people in circle two. This is the cumulative number of links you have until you have all of them by circle five. But if you are in the inverse regime, most of your people are already in circle one and then you have a few in the other circles. Now, when will this happen? Well, the way we thought we, we could see this is uh, the following. First, let me tell you the uh, normal regime. We went to the data uh, from this paper and we fitted to every individual there, to the data they had, our theory and found their muse. Okay? And we found this distribution of muse. The, the fitting is also quite a complicated procedure, but it's, uh, I don't want to go into that. But you see, in a normal situation where people have normal Dunbar circles, most people have a positive mu and the mean, or well, not the, the, the modes and the mean are close to one. Okay, so that's normal. That's number of circles. And this is, like I said, data from these guys here. This picture is one of these guys. This is a histogram of the frequency of people that have a mu value. And there's a little number of, uh, a, a small number of guys that have negative mu, the weird guys. And when you look at them, you see the inverse regime. So, we said, okay, now we have to look for this inverse regime. This one we know. But where can we find the inverse regime? Well, this gave us, gave us a clue. Okay, when you have very few people available with whom you can make relationships, you can handle them all. So we thought, okay, that's the point. So these guys could really be in all in everybody's inner circle because they don't have other options. 
So we said, okay, I mean, how can we find this in reality? And here came, came uh, a friend, Jose Luis Molina, who is an anthropologist from Barcelona, whom I had the pleasure to meet in one of these conferences we organized on Econo Socio stuff. And I remember that in one of these conferences he presented data about Bulgarian immigrants in Roses Girona. And he said, well, that may be a situation in which if there are not that many immigrants and they keep speaking to guys with the same strange language, they may have very few available relationships. So I went to Jose Luis and asked him, and Jose Luis is a very nice guy. So he sent me Bulgarians, he sent me Sikhs, he sent me Chinese, he sent me Filipino. Well, we have four data sets to validate our theory. So we went to that data, and there you have it. When you fit our model to the Bulgarians in process, practically all of them have a negative mu, and practically all of them have this structure. We have the fits for every, for every one of them. You can show them. The, this is typical, so it's really typical. It's a one individual, but there are many of them. Great, so Bulgarians worked. What happened with the others? They all work. They all have inverse structure for the Dunbar circles. They have their limited community all in the inner circle, as predicted by our theory. It's not that they have an enormously large cognitive capability. It's that the links they have available are a few. And then they are all close. They can handle them as close friends. Uh, <laughs> That's a, that's a good one. Well, I th I'm not really sure, but I think that these were 21 Chinese in Barcelona living like in the same building or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say so, but it could be the case. Yeah. The, the Bulgarians, I know better this data set because I, I discussed it a lot with Jose Luis and, and these guys live differently. And I think that the total number of Bulgarians in Roses must be a little bit larger, but not a lot. Yeah, but this is, yes? I was thinking a little about Elisa Jacob, because I thought that you have a total network, which is fixed, but I was supposing that those that have a net number that is smaller, and one that has a net number that is very big, the one that is small might have the chance to have closer friends than the others. And this is what needs yeah. to happen here as well. You don't need to have a a very close community, but you have very little friends, a very little yeah. followers of yeah. everything. Most of them are well known. So they yeah. be part of Yeah, in fact, we, I'm not sure I have the data now here. Mm, no. No, okay. So uh, we have observed that when we have a situation in which most people have a normal structure, if you have like two or three guys with the inverse structure, they typically have very few friends. Well, th that should be the, the moment in which mu goes from yes. negative to what positive. Is in terms of <sighs> it's hard to say because I don't know how to measure cognitive capability. I can come com with proxies, but again, uh, the cost of a relationship is cognitive capability, but also time. Sure. So it's that's really difficult. It's so. I think I'm doing fine in terms of time. So. This part of the talk, I think I can tell you now again that the, our model is able to connect both the Dunbar's number and the structure of ego networks with our cognitive c limitations. It connects both things and it produces them both just from that uh, social brain hypothesis. And we have also predicted a regime that hadn't been observed before. So I think that this is quite a, a successful and interesting model and now we want to do more things with it which is now we want to go to the social structure I'm not going to tell about this now I want to tell about other thing but what we want is to see whether we can infer things about the structure of the society from the building blocks of the ego networks that are in the society so now we have a bunch of people we have to glue together to form a society and the fact that we have a model for the ego networks we think we can do things about the social structure in general. No, no, not at all. With ego, with its no. ego, with its alter ego. Yeah. 
Yeah. And there were no interactions. Yeah. It's the availability of interacting particles, if you want. So your claim is that these number of circles are independent of any way to interact. I have a stronger claim. But that so far that's okay. Yeah. Ricardo. Um, uh, as I said, I said, there is a, this fact that is you have cost and you have benefits at the same time. Yeah. And uh, for instance, uh, for a sick community, uh, what you do with your family is very important. Yeah. So it's like a, 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 a work with us one like hundred years ago. So you believe that this check the our networks in Europe one uh, hundred years ago we would have, would have uh, the inverse curve. I would love to. I'd love to, but I don't have the data. Yeah, you think, uh, you, you know, getting this data is really tough. I mean, this is, we tend as physicists to disregard the work of other communities, but uh, for instance, Jose Luis, every time that gets his data, spends like six months to a year. Because first he needs to make familiar with this community, and then he can start giving them questionnaires and whatnot. So the data is scarce. If you want to go 100, years ago back that would be lovely but I really doubt that, that there is <laughs> let me tell you something though the when we sent this paper for review the editor sent back a reference about a boat in the early 20th century traveling to the North Pole or something like that in which they have done a sociological study and what they see is compatible with our inverse but this is still with the constraint community more than yeah it's again the constraint community cultural uh, factors yeah so the influence of family, hard to tell. In fact, in all this story of the circles is also uh, a little bit fishy because uh, in principle you can have, uh, you should you respect that your family is in your inner circle and then, but you also have close friends, sometimes that could be longer than, so it, it's more like, like an abstraction that has to be realized later. And therefore the role of family is unclear. But there's something there. Okay, so we want to follow up in our school experiment and I will tell you about that because there's a lot of info on there. And actually, in our school experiment, we see that knowledge of the circles allow us to predict friendships. So we will go into that if you would uh, allow me. Now, that was the part that is already finished. This is what we're doing now. We're working with this school in Madrid and the same usual suspects, but now we also have the help of Maria Pereda, who was with us in Madrid and now is in Aachen. And uh, what we did is the following. We contacted this school and we conducted a survey with the students. In fact, this is part of a long-term project. I will tell you a little bit more about that. And we, for that, we made an app. They have to enter the app and then they have to answer the questions I'll show you the questions in a second. And they have these, uh, uh, these menus, and they, they have the list of all the kids in the school. So they can mark as many as they want. We do that in order to avoid some criticism of the things they do, the anthropologists. They ask the people for names. They use the name generator methods. And then people claim that, OK, then you are already selecting the important ones. But typically, people give a lot of names. So. It's hard to tell that they are being biased that way. In any event, we offer them the possibility to say things about every kid in the school. OK? And now, what, which questions do we ask? Well, this is the universe we're we are doing. This We're working with uh, uh, kids that are 10 years old and 17 years old, more or less. And uh, these are the questions we ask. So four of these questions are intended to uh, elicit relationships that are uh, positive and with different degrees of strength. So if you had a personal and serious problem, with whom would you share it? That would be for us, and we discuss a lot about the questions. You cannot ask them, who's your close friend? That's meaningless. So we have to really like disguise the question. So uh, if there are, this is a negative, no, this is a positive question. If there are schoolmates that you don't want to leave the school, Say who. If you could whom choose with whom to sit at the lunch table, say who. Now, this is a negative one. With whom 
you would not sit in, no, you would not do any kind of activity. Not any activity, nothing. I don't want to see their faces. If you have to work with something for an assignment that may or may not have to do with friendship, with whom would you work? And finally, with whom you would not work? Because you may have very good friends, but you know they are very lazy and you don't want to work with them. So we ask these, these questions. Then there's a bunch of other questions that have to do with personality traits, but I'm not involved in that research and I, uh, I'm not telling about it. I don't know. It's a very, it's a very hippie school. <laughs> yeah, no, no exams. Everybody's happy. Uh, no, in fact, I'm, I'm now trying to negotiate with a more normal school in, in Madrid to do the same stuff. And uh, this is a happy people. So. <coughs> Uh, how representative are they? I don't know. That's why I want to go to other schools. This is the, the network colors correspond uh, to courses. Of course, there are two classes per course. Uh, but in general, most of the relationships, of course, are within a, a course. And these are the data on circles. If you look at the uh, serious problem question, you find an, an out degree, how many people you tell them, uh, of around six. Uh, this is uh, don't leave school is around 10 so these are numbers that are reasonable but then if you uh, really want to look into what would be circles let me uh, I will come back to that in a second you have to look in a different way but anyway those are comparable numbers what I'm showing here is in the diagonal is the degree distribution of the six questions you see the four positive the two negative they are all skewed to the right, more or less. So the, uh, in the negative questions, uh, there's, the degrees are, are low. This is the out degree. People don't name many, many enemies. They name a few. And then there's correlation among the positive ones, and also among the negative ones. In the, in the degrees, if you have a large degree on a negative network, you have a large degree in, an, in the other negative network. So that's very unpopular. That's it. And if you're a popular guy, you have a large degree in all positive networks. In terms of in degree, it's about the same. Although now it's clear that in degree tells about me, how many people think I'm popular. So for instance, if I'm popular, I'm uh, popular in all positive networks. And I'm, if I'm popular, I'm not, I don't have a large degree in the negative networks. So that's kind of easy. Now, this is all the links we have. This is a little bit of a complicated uh, slide again. We tried to come up with uh, something that condensate the information. So we look at the uh, overlap of the different networks. So this is the uh, case in which you look at, uh, I lost something here. Yeah, but these are, of the four positive questions, these are the four possible three by three intersections. And you see they all have lots of uh, overlap among them. So in the end, we decided to call the positive network the network circle two. So the sympathy group. That includes, of course, your support clique, but also your good friends. And this is this big chunk here. This is the union of all the positive networks. And if you consider the union of all the positive networks, you see that the negative networks have, as they should, very little overlap with them. Okay, so you are not, uh, if I'm in a positive relation with you, I'm not in a negative relation with you in general. Okay? Now, when you look at the circle two as I just defined it, you see the circle two has a mean of around 15. This is the degree distribution of the union network. And now for circle one, if you look, we were, this is funny. There's this idea of uh, Robin that I don't like that the support group, these four people, should be a clique. So they sh all should be in their inner circles. Well, I may not like it, but it's not so that far from reality. When we look at every person and we look at the largest clique in which they are, this is the statistics. So the average is like five, like the support group. And uh, these links are like 80% of them are in circle one. 
So in the support group, you have some circle two links, which shouldn't be there according to Dunbar, but the most of it is circle one. Yes? Uh, do you conduct this experiment uh, one time or you see it? So far, yeah, that's a good question. So far, we did it one time, but now we're planning on a wave of like uh, several times, uh, shorter uh, surveys, and we want to see how the network evolves like every two, three weeks. And we want to do it for years. I mean, I would like to do it at least for six years because I'd like to see whether what I see for the oldest students now is a proxy for what happened to these guys when they get there. So I want to do this for years. How many students do you think that we can? Well, as, much, as many as the school will allow us. But we really want to, uh, to have at least once every month. Once every month? We want to do it. But in the end of the... Uh, Okay. Yeah. Okay. There's a number of things we're offering. Uh, for instance, we already did something good. We find one student. That's a very sad story. She marked as negative all the 300 other students. Every single them. Every single one of them. She went through all the menus and marked them all as negative. So the first thing we don't have the name, but. The first thing we did when we saw that, we called the school and said, look look who this person is, you have a problem there. And they indeed had a problem there. They guessed, but they're very happy and hippie. And <laughs> this person will get integrated. And, and no, 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 there's something very wrong. So, so it wasn't messing with your data on the, with the purpose of messing with your data? No, no, no. And then other things we are uh, telling them is that we, if we run this uh, offering now, we can also try to use these ideas of uh, early warning uh, signals to see whether it's going to be a change in the social structure of classes. We already have designed an application for them to make optimal working groups. That's a nightmare for teachers because they ask the students, who do you want to work with and who do you don't want to work with? And they try to match it by hand, and that's crazy. So we're using our data to give them better uh, working groups, so we are, this is what we're doing. Basically. And we're very nice people. <laughs> so this is, if you use other definitions of circle one, you get also small numbers. I'm not going to go really into that. Uh, the scalings are also around small numbers between zero and three. So that sort of works. This is the out degree by gender, girl to girl, girl to boy. There's a lot of we discussed here, but I don't think we want to go into that. Interestingly, there's this question of reciprocity I haven't discussed. All, all the time I've been speaking of a directed network. Now, how often are these uh, links reciprocated? As you see, the numbers in circle one, for instance, well, are 58% or so for uh, girl to girl, and only like 30% for boy or uh, girl to boy. So girls don't reciprocate a lot. They're boys thinking they are their close friends. Which age again? Sorry? Which is? I don't have a reason. <laughs> and most of the reasons I can think of would be politically incorrect. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I, I would change. Like, there, is this an elementary school? Or a uh, no, no, this is uh, from 10 to 17. Okay. I have this data for, for courses too, and they change along the, along the courses. But it's just one wave, so I, I would really like to have more data on that. But in terms of reciprocity, we are looking into this because we believe that it could be possible that just uh, reciprocating at random would give you this degree of reciprocity. So then this would be meaningless. It's not that really these friendships are reciprocated for the sake of the friendship. You cannot say that if we can show that random is compatible with this. Yeah. Now, prediction. This is something we are also trying. Uh, this is a lot of numbers. I don't really want to go into that. But what we tried is uh, doing things like this. I have these two guys. I want to predict whether or not there is a link among them from one to the other. And then I have the info on the number of people in the circle one of this guy, the number of people of the circle one of this guy, and their common acquaintances. And with that information, depending on the method you use, you can get up to 90% accuracy in predicting whether there is a link or not among them. Now, uh, sorry. Model fitting, and here comes the model again. We fitted our model to the data. And here you have it. So you see that most people have healthy, uh, normal Dunbar circles, positive mu's. We have to assign weights to the links, and we do that 
considering the reciprocity, the reciprocity in a different layer, etc. But we assign uh, degrees, or excuse me, weights, and then we have a way to fit the model. And again, it gives things that are reasonable. And if you look at the people with the negative views, they have very few friends, in fact. Now, believe it or not, this ugly picture is to me the most important of this part of the talk. When we fit, we can fit to the positive network, but we can also fit to the negative network. And in the negative network, it seems that there are circles there. Interestingly, this is the mu for every individual, this is the mu you find for the positive network, and the mu you find for the negative network. And you see a bunch of points, there's no correlation there. So it seems that the way we are handling our relationship, negative and positive, is uncorrelated. We are treating those as different problems. We are devoting different parts of our cognitive capabilities to that. And if that is true, we should see what happens. That if you go to the negative network, you also see number circles, because it's exactly the same problem. So what we are claiming is that for anything that involves tasks with different cognitive costs, you're going to find this structure, even if it's not a social thing. We're planning experiments to show that. But to me, it's clear that the Dunbar circle thing is not a social phenomenon. It's a cognitive phenomenon. We cannot do it otherwise, because we cannot do tasks that have different costs otherwise. We have to distribute them like that. And the fact that we see uncorrelated values for positive and negative networks tells me that every bunch of tasks is handled in some part of the brain and does it in a worse or better manner depending on the part. So finally about network measures, we didn't find a lot of correlation with uh, anything for the positive relationship. There is a correlation between mu and page rank that is negative. So if you have a large mu, you have a lower page rank. So if that means that you are uh, devoting your cognitive cost to many people, so having centrality in terms of page rank means that you are focusing on a few important relationships, basically. And there's lot more correlations with magnitudes uh, for the negative relationships, like without degree centrality, degree centrality. We are still working out what this really means. So in summary, what I just told you is that we have a new insight from here on the cognitive control of what we do. The fact that the negative network is described as the positive network tells us that it's the cognitive thing that is the limiting factor of everything. And the information in the circles, I didn't tell us that because Ignacio told me yesterday, so I don't have a slide. The information in the negative circle predicts links in the positive circles with an accuracy of 70%. So that is a point in favor of the, of the social balance theory of sociologists that tells you that the friend of my friend or the enemy of the friend of my enemy is my friend the uh, enemy no yeah so there's true information in the negative circles that goes into the positive network and that's it thank you very much for your attention and i hope you are still alive Answer. Question. Single. If I understood you correctly, um, what you've been doing is you, you optimize the cost-benefit function, so which assumes that always you will uh, arrive to the optimum. Mm -hmm. So yeah. certainly the landscape does not necessarily have to be convex, and the whole thing in reality will be a dynamical uh, process. Yeah, absolutely. And you assume certainly that you always get close to this optimum and how far would a dynamical model support that and would you also see influences that hint towards that for example you would have these consequences of dynamical process which lead maybe to frustrations or that you do not end up in the, in the optimum? That's an excellent question. I should say that uh, this is a static picture. We are uh, looking at something on average but it's true what you're saying. That the number of relationships you have changes with time for different reasons. I move to another town and I have to start again. And so, and some people just fade out and some people come in. So this is like really uh, 
uh, a long-term picture averaging over time. But it would be really great, and that's why we want to have data like on a monthly basis to see how relationships develop, whether a person always has the same mu or not, whether it's only growing or it's random. And uh, we really think that this is going to be the key to understand how close we get to this optimum and how much we fight to get to this optimum. But for that, we need this monthly data. And to me, if we could have it for five, six years, then we could ask, answer reasonably this question. Maybe going, going a little bit on this dynamic, uh, on dynamics, but in, a, in, a, in, in, a, in the simplest possible case. So imagine that you are not in the close communities or not related to the Bulgarians. I mean, you have someone with 150 or what, the different circles. Uh, and then you, so in your model, you have some, let's say, finite budget of resources, of these cognitive resources. So how is in, in, you, in your view, I mean, the, the uh, process of getting a new friend, a new acquaintance? So your budget is full, you have using for 100 friends, and, and now you have just one more friend. So, I mean, will it's the it's budget increase, or will you lose one friend? Uh, in general, I think you tend to lose them. I mean, I speak from my experience. You have very good friends in primary school. Then you move to high school. First, a very close example, my son. He studied in a primary school, and then he decided to go to a different high school from his friends, really close friends in primary school. Well, six years afterwards, he doesn't see them at all. He goes out with the guys in the high school. So I think that one, of course, it's within the error. You can accommodate one, you can accommodate two. But if you try to get like 10 new in, about 10 should go out. And life tells me that this is generally the case. On the other hand, other things could come in the way. For instance, you may be very busy at some point and then you have a few friends, but then you retire. I'm not looking at you. <laughs> and then, and then you have lots of time to make new friends. Then you could have new friends coming in. So it's hard to tell in principle, but in, in normal working life period, I'd say that uh, like this famous Spanish uh, uh, humor actor says, Jose Mota, las gallinas que entran por las que van saliendo. Las que entran por las que salen. So one in, one out. Yes. Uh, thank you for that. Yes. In, in that app that you uh, use for questionnaire, did you uh, ask a, a general question about some idea or opinion? So no. No, no at all. No, no. We asked a bunch of other questions because my colleague Jose Cuesta is interested in correlating in SIP. Excuse me, in see if there is any correlation between personality traits and network position. So there's a bunch of questions related to the big five traits in personality and whatnot, which I and Jose believe is crap. Uh, and we want to prove it's crap. But uh, no, other than that, there's nothing about opinions. Can I love uh, asking some questions about some general idea, anything uh, related to the students? No, no, we haven't. Okay. It's a nice idea because that would help us to look into problems of opinion diffusion and, and things like that. But on the other hand, we have to be careful in how much time we ask the students to do this. So it's a trade-off between the time they devote to answering and the number of questions you may want to ask. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, I have a question about, the, about how you got to the data. So. Um, did you give all of them the same questionnaire that, as you gave the, the high school students? Or no, no, no. That, that, I mean, the only data from me is the school data. The other data is the one that it was obtained by uh, Jose Luis Molina. And there the questionnaire is open. That was what I say. They call it the name generator thing. They ask, uh, give me names of your friends. And they have like 30 slots. And they ask them to fill the 30 slots. Uh, so there's been a lot of discussion among sociologists and anthropologists whether in doing that you are making them focus on the really close links. 
and that's why they insist it's important that they have to fill 30 names so they don't show you that so it's a different thing altogether Ah, okay, yeah, that's the first good thing because the next question would have been in the school do, do you not shut up friends who are not in the same school as the, as the kids you're asking? No, I mean, we, are, we are not looking into that because we're only offering them the listing from the school. Yeah, but that, that supports a smaller friend, side, friend circle, doesn't it? Or, as Ignacio likes to say, you have not one structure for handling relationships, but many. You have one for school. Because if you have five guys in your click support here, in principle, according to Robin's original idea, you shouldn't have any more. But you have your family at home. So the way we are seeing it, Robin is not very happy with this, but the way we're seeing it is that you don't have just one structure, you have a bunch of structures. One for work, one for school, one for your family. And that would be consistent with the fact that, again, it's distributing costly tasks up to a limit. So that's the way we see it. Okay. The hippie school doesn't have classes. Excuse me? Like the hippie school you, you, you explained, it, don't have a st class structure? Yeah, it's a structure in two classes per year, but it's kind of flexible and the kids are typically around the classroom and it's... Uh, and what if, uh, you, if, you uh, if, if you ask me, I wouldn't send my kid there. Okay. <laughs> no, but what if you scale down uh, your network uh, to the class level? Or most or most of same? most of what we see are within the class. Okay, well, but there are still a few links from outside the class because they meet, for instance, for lunch. Okay. They share the patio at the same time, so there are some friendships among classes. But most is within the class. So you, since you find the positive news, means the class is not a constraint. It's not constraining you. The uh, or at least it's not uh, really constraining them in the sense that they have to restrict themselves to that. So they could do, or maybe the cognitive capability of these guys is small. And uh, just, uh, how you would explain move in like human terms? How social you are. I know people that can tell you, I have this neighbor, I live in a, in a condo with 150 apartments. I have this neighbor that knows everybody. But he can tell you their lives. He can tell you this guy works there and this guy, and they have recently divorced and her mother died. And I always ask him, Pepe, damn it, how on earth do you know that? Not only do you know that, you can ask people, how do you remember that? <laughs> so that would be a guy with a really uh, big mu. No, excuse me, small mu. Uh, no, no, big, large cognitive capability to handle the links. Yeah, large mu. If you have a small mu, you are. No offense, an autist. But if you have negative mu? Yeah, yeah, that's negative mu. Okay. So if you're like in, in, in zero, you're okay. Yeah. Yeah. Not so bad, not so good. You're average guy. Okay. Uh, with the distribution of the different moves, news of the people that live in the same society, explain about the society? Like if all are social or they are less social all? or One interesting thing would be to do this kind of tests really massively and see what's the distribution of mu's you get mm -hmm. and you could you do that in a different uh, in different environments to see also how their environment uh. but again i mean you could find uh, coming back to what i said earlier you could find a guy that has a very uh, uh, negative mu so inverse circles at work mm -hmm. this person goes to work don't talk to anybody go back home and then with his friends he has lots of friends yeah. so is what we said about positive and negative, mu's don't correlate. But could a negative mu not also mean that you're, um, like, when, suppo let's suppose you're a person who has quite many close friends, like 20 really close friends, but apart from that, you just uh, shut everyone off. Like, could yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's also an interpretation. That's, that's, not, mm, that's not an artist, right? And well, <laughs> yes, it's not an artist, of course. I mean, I, I was saying it as an analogy, but in general it's a different person from most people yes. most people conform to the usual dumbbell circle structure okay. so it's a weirdo in that respect yeah. may, it may be more pleasurable to have this so, so it means that the cost exceeds the, the, the uh, of making a link exceeds the benefits of uh, yeah and those so this person keeps these 20 friends very close and forgets about the rest and focuses yeah
They're like, they're, they sound like, okay, the example I was thinking about is not just the kind of a lot of like Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so yes. Do you think you could find some other um, interesting feature between the patterns of, of friendship that could be interesting for the school, like the ones? That yeah. Have, uh, One thing we, we want to explore with them and now. The problem with this kind of work is that uh, from the viewpoint of data protection is complicated. Mm -hmm. So for starters, all the data in the school, we never see the names of the kids, we only get an anonymized version in our servers, and so on and so forth. So one thing we are telling them is that they should, if they allow us particularly to look at, uh, at a longitudinal set of surveys, they should try to see whether there is any correlation with their performance with their marks because again if there is such correlation it could happen that one one person is changing their mu or the, the value we find in the fitting it's also changing its performance so we, you should be able to tell them look there's something going on with this person do something one thing i want to do is do this stuff with my university <laughs> and there i have access to the marks hopefully and that thing I think would be very helpful. Uh, on the other hand, we also want to connect it with other apparently big problem in, in academia lately or in university, which is the prevalence of mental health diseases. So there's apparently among, particularly among PhD students, there's many more mental health issues than among the general population. So one should be able to use that to track down possible. I think that Sunelman has this kind of data. Or yeah, data on, data. on mobile phones. On mobile phone data. Yeah. Um, I'm disappointed with this question session <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't see any question on what you said and what I think is your strong claim. You, you said you were going to make a strong claim and I think that the strong claim you made is that these uh, Dumbar number and Dumbar circles have nothing to do with social phenomena. Yep. So that Margaret Thatcher was right. That is nothing like a society but the only individuals. No, 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 no. To, to make a claim for strong. No, no. First, even if I thought that, that if Margaret Thatcher said it, I would disagree. <laughs> but second. I don't disagree, but that's what you said. There is nothing in this number that has to see with social interaction. But, but that's, let me, let me give you, I'm going to give you an analogy and you're going to like it. Okay. Bear with me for a minute. You have an atom, right? atom, normal atom, with its layers and whatnot, and that's basically the quantum phenomena, electromagnetic forces quantified and whatnot. And then you have a material. The material is made of these atoms interacting with each other. The interaction is there. Now what I claim is that what I'm describing is the social atom. Ego networks are like this. Sociality, social phenomena, coming when you have to match up all these ego networks into a society. That's where the interaction is. That tells me how many balanced electrons I have. And how much time do I have available to devote to new people. And that's the interaction among these ego networks. I'm just describing the, build, the very building block of the society. So, strictly speaking, I'm not speaking of any social phenomena here. Okay, so your, your indicators, these things that you observe macroscopically, which are these numbers and these symbols. We will have to explain have them. to do with any social phenomena. I, I thought that was a strong statement, but I... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I say. Okay, more questions, comments? Now, let me tell you that uh, uh, Andrew is working hard today, so he will give an old talk <laughs> at 7 p.m. In, uh, in La Caixa, down, uh, downtown Palma. Uh, it's uh, less technical, I believe. Much less technical. <laughs> it has, a, <laughs> it has a, a very much, uh, how to say, uh, challenging title. And let me try to translate that to English. Even uh, gods uh, cannot cope uh, with the stupidity or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a so sentence from the German philosopher uh, Schiller. Uh, Ingo could tell that, that's, that sentence in German, it would probably be better. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, you are all uh, also welcome to, to attend this talk there, but, but that will be in Spanish. Anyway, thank you for being such a wonderful audience and to, for really letting me rehearse 
the talk of which I expect to leave for the next year. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, guys.